Okay, let's get back to Barrel Point. Talked about history and the wood and even wood terroir. But now let's get more practical. What does wood, the barrel, bring to you, the wine consumer? And we're gonna point out some specifics here. In other words, what is the barrel's effect on the wine I'm actually gonna drink? In true tangible terms, not all this abstract stuff. Uh, three things, <laughs> three things. Uh, color, uh, body, and flavor slash aroma, specific flavor slash aroma. We'll start with color. Uh, when we are thinking about color, I'm gonna start with actually one of the hardest, which is like white wine. And some white wines do spend time in oak barrels. Not a lot, some, but not most. And when you think of white wine, well, they're white, they're clear, though, you know, slightly tinted yellow because the grapes that we use to make white wines don't have color in the skins, they don't go through maceration, so you don't get a lot of color. If you oak that white wine, put it in an oak barrel for a secondary fermentation or for maturation for six months or a year, you will get some color. Now, naturally, I would think you would assume, oh, and the color will be brown. <laughs> Yes, if you <laughs> aged a white wine in an oak barrel for two years, it would be brown, and I don't think I've ever really seen that too much. Liquor is a better example. Whiskey, when it goes into a barrel, gets all of its color from the wood, and that's a lot of color. You ever had bourbon, scotch, even a dark tequila? But back to white wine. White wine will actually get more enriched color and a deeper color when it spends time in oak, but it's not necessarily just because it's extracted color straight from the wood, okay? It's got more to do with oxygenation and the stuff I'll talk about in just a second with mouthfeel. So when it comes to wood aging, it will impart some color, an enriching color to white wines. Brown wines are usually bad. <laughs> if you're buying a white wine and it's brown, that usually means it's fully oxidized and it's bad, probably don't buy, okay? Let me use a better example, which is liquor. Actually, I should say first, with red wines, red wines are red wines, and they usually have a lot of color because the skins have colors, and so most of red wine color comes from their skins. There may be some color attributes pulled in directly from the oak wood, but they're negligible, okay? So white wines get more enriched color, slightly, Red wines, negligible effect on color. Whiskey, way more effect. And I should say liquor in general. And that's because this is where you really get excessive. When you use brand new wooden uh, barrels, oak barrels, and you put your raw distilled spirit into it, you, uh, for most brown liquors, all of the color of that brown liquor is being extracted, literally extracted, and slight oxida oxidation from the wood, okay? That's as clear as an example as I can give you. And for those of you that don't know how liquor is made, maybe I should do a whole different lecture just on distillation and all the different liquors out there. But lic distillation of liquor, creation of liquor, is just taking beer or wine and basically purifying it by extracting everything you can except for the alcohol. You concentrate the alcohol by eliminating water and all the other stuff and that's called distillation. And when you're doing that, when you distill any liquor, any liquor you've seen anywhere on planet Earth, no matter what color it is, when it was distilled, when it was produced and purified and distilled, it is perfectly clear it's white. As clear as water, all of them, no exceptions. I know you're never supposed to talk in extremes because there's always an exception. There ain't no exceptions here. When you're doing distillation, one of the first things that's pulled out is color. So what comes out on the other end of the distillation process is a clear fluid. Always just is. So when you see any liquor that has color, that's come from somewhere else. And if it's brown, it's mostly come from wood. So again, we're thinking mostly of bourbon, uh, scotch, but maybe you've even seen some rums, aged rums that are brown. Maybe you've seen aged tequilas that are golden brown, huh? Aged from aged tequila, yeah. Aged in what? Aged in oak barrels. All of the color in liquor comes from oak. All right, I know. Now there are some exceptions to that statement. Because in Scotland, you'd think the purveyors of, you know, tradition and everything proper and purity, that they would, you know, 
do it by the books and just get all the color from the wood with their new whiskey that they age in the wood specifically to mellow it out and get some color. But you would be wrong. Actually, in Scotland, you can add uh, artificial caramelized uh, uh, coloring to the scotch in order to make it a deeper color. That is not so in America. In America, by law, by American law, if it says bourbon on it, it has to have spent one year in a brand new oak barrel, period, and no artificial colors or additives are thrown in. Booyah! Go America! So when you have Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, Evan Williams, any other number of gentlemen who have a whiskey named after them, that color is coming almost exclusively from a barrel. And again, we said uh, there's rums and even tequilas. You can get a white or silver tequila. That's tequila that was never in an oak barrel. Or you can get a gold or a ropesado, I believe it is, rested tequila. And they have some more golden rich colors. That's because they spend some time in an oak barrel. And then you have Añejo, which is aged, old tequila. That's darker yet. It's because it spent more time maturing or aging in an oak barrel. Got it? That's the role of color. However, and, and, and I'm talking color extracted from the wood itself. However, you also get color from our number two barrel effect, and that is when you age in oak barrels, be it wine or whiskey, you get a fuller body, a richer, creamier mouth feel due to the integration of oxygen. What? I thought oxygen was bad. Yes, we covered this last lecture too. Large amounts of oxygen uh, during wine production are terrible because they allow the growth of bacteria, bacteria which turns your wine into vinegar. However, uh, during maturation in oak barrels, you do have small amounts of oxygen that are being integrated through the wood. Remember, wood is porous. Uh, and believe it or not, this always astounds me, but you, when you go to an aging uh, a cellar for wine or an aging uh, warehouse for whiskey, you can go up to any barrel at any given time and pull it open and there'll be a space, okay, so round barrel. There'll be an amount of space uh, up at the top. And that is because even though it looks like an airtight, liquid tight container, which obviously it's liquid tight because nothing's dripping out of it, and it seems airtight, the wood is porous so it's breathing. And every year that space comes at the top from evaporation. So what's evaporating? Water but also alcohol. And you actually want that. It's actually a good thing because it's a slow loss of water and alcohol and therefore a slow integration of small amounts of oxygen back into the barrel. And it's that integration of oxygen we've talked about previously that binds with different molecules, that rounds things off, that helps kind of take the the edge off of astringency and tannic components that are in the wine and whiskey. So, and back to the white wine, and it's actually that kind of slow amounts of oxidation that is enriching the color of a white wine that's been in oak for two or four months. Not so much that it's getting straight color out of the wood. Does that make sense? The amount of liquid that is lost every year actually astounds me though, because I still never believe these numbers when I read them, but every barrel of whiskey and wine supposedly loses something like three to five or six liters of fluid every year. Yes, yeah, put five liters in front of you. That seems like a lot to me. Five or six liters lost out of every barrel, which again is in creating this headspace in there, uh, but it's actually desired for other reasons too, which is, you know, you hate to lose alcohol, but you don't mind losing the water because as water evaporates out of either one of these beverages, what's what's it doing? It's concentrating the flavors and aromas and everything that's left. So it's you, your wine or whiskey is just getting, mm, it's getting, ah, it's rounding out its rough edges, but it's getting deeper and more complex in its flavors. And with wine, maybe whiskey too, but you don't want to leave too much headspace, so you wouldn't leave your wine aging in barrels for five years and never go look at it, because it, you know if you lose six liters a year, the barrel will be half empty. So you actually top it up. So you know you take one barrel that's lost six or eight liters, and you use it in a siphon and just kind of go fill up the other barrels every year that have lost you know five or six liters. 
And again, you're enriching, you're emboldening, you're making more complex the beverage that's left due to evaporation. And that's one of the awesome things about wine barrels. More mouthfeel, more complexity, more everything. Number three is the flavors. We're saying, oh, it's enriching all these things that are left. Enriching what? Well, it's enriching the grape flavors that are there. But with wood, we've already talked about it, it has all these phenols that are going in and out of the wood. The wood is being leached out by the wine or whiskey that's in it. And what's being leached out is phenols. So we're adding in the vanillin, uh, uh, some more tannic component, but also straight up flavors and aromas that we say, that smells like wood. <laughs> if you ever smelt fresh hewn oak, it is delicious. Salt dust, salt dust, pencil shavings, uh, a cedar closet. Again, these are woods I've named in previous lectures. They smell good to a lot of us. And so you get those things that are being incorporated into the wine or whiskey as well. Now, when it comes to wine, we'll leave whiskey on, on the back porch now. And anybody wants to leave some whiskey on my back porch, that's cool too. But leave whiskey out there for a minute. We'll just talk about wine. When we are now saying what actual flavors can we attribute to the wood in uh, wine and the maturation process in a wood barrel. We can now get specific and hopefully these are things that you may have already seen in different places already which are uh, um, when it comes to red wines that have spent some time uh, fermenting or maturing in oak barrels you will see descriptions like uh, hints of caramel, uh, cream, uh, smoke, spice, cedar, vanilla, and I do have to take a TV time out here to make sure that <clears throat> you understand when I'm naming these things, especially vanilla, there are people like, I don't know what Boyer's talking about. I don't know what this label's talking about. I don't ever get vanilla. Remember, we're talking about elements of the overall wine that can be there or might be absent, but if they're there, they're usually in small amounts around the periphery. And the thing about vanilla, vanillin, is that it's not like if you see a wine description that says, oh, good hints of vanilla, that you think you're going to eat an ice cream cone. No, it's saying that there are small amounts of that in there. And you might detect it, but vanillin also brings about this kind of, again, kind of a sweet and unctuous sweetness to it that may not be in your brain vanilla ice cream, but it's lending itself. It's propping up some other flavors and making things more round, as does spice and caramel and cream. These are contributing peripheral actors in the grand stage of things and they just marry really well with big bold red fruit flavors which is why we age a lot of great red wines in oak so you could just you could just take your awesome big red california cabernet sauvignon you could stick it in a stainless steel vat for two or five years and it might be good maybe it's great but you will not have, and it may have all these flavors, but it's not going to have any of these flavors and aromas. And so that's why we do oak is because it's like, these aren't competing flavors. These are marrying flavors. They, they complement each other in really great ways in really great wines. They can be overdone as can anything I've talked about. They can be overdone. So for those of you saying, I've never tasted vanilla. I don't know what Boyer's talking about. Go try Yellowtail Shiraz from Australia. They go out of their way to try to make it a vanilla bomb. And some winemakers go out of their way to make it an oak bomb. We call them the oak monsters, where you get aggressive tannins and almost whiskey-type taste out of a wine That's because it's been overdone, and it tastes like you're drinking pencil shavings. And it's like, if that's what you taste first, the winemaker has not done their job well. I mean, I guess that's, unless that's what they really like. So back to the descriptors. Those are some common ones you might see about red wines that have been uh, oak aged. Common descriptors of white wines that have been uh, exposed to oak, and again, these are fewer. A lot of red wines see oak, some white wines do. Most do not, okay? But those that do will pick up some pretty unique descriptors that are quite delicious, namely uh, coconut, cinnamon, clove and back to vanilla and i mean just think about that spice combination like the spice islands cinnamon clove and vanilla mm, who doesn't want that they're actually to me and this is a personal call here when you get an oak aged white wine 
they still should marry really well. The fruit flavors and the, and the wood flavors should marry well, but the fruit flavors in white wines are usually more delicate, so you can detect more of these. And, and that not, is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's why not a lot of white wines see a lot of time in oak, because the wood can overwhelm white oak flavors really quickly. I'm sorry. Wood can overwhelm white grape flavors quickly if you don't control it, okay? So coconut, really? Yeah, and especially when it comes to things like uh, California Chardonnay, something about an American oak barrel that's used to age California Chardonnay for a short period of time, you just, it pulls out this kind of coconut element that's just delicious. If you like it, it's just delicious. And hints of vanilla, just delicious, along with a little bit of the wood flavor. But not a lot, because it can get excessive fast. Other dimensions that you get from the barrel that are unique to the barrel. Oh, by the way, back when I'm talking about coconut and cinnamon um, or cedar, you do also have to keep in mind that it depends on what grape you're using. What's the wine that you're putting into that barrel? You can't get coconut from just anything. I, I don't believe you can get a, a, a essence of coconut from Sauvignon Blanc. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's there. And you won't get an essence of coconut just from a Chardonnay that's been done in stainless steel. But it's something about doing a Chardonnay in an oak barrel that, oh, now you can get some of that. Does that make sense? So it's a unique combination of what, what wine are you starting with and what wood are you putting it in and for how long you can get some of these unique flavors, okay? Uh, the last element I'll talk about that will affect finished flavor uh, and aroma of a wine is the toastiness of the barrel. That's right. Uh, if you think back to the barrel making video, they were at different times, different parts of the process were uh, had it over top of an open flame and they were using it when they were shaping, they were burning the inside and then once they constructed it, they actually started a little fire inside. That's called toasting. And the amount of toastiness can affect the finished wine, can add uh, or marry in some flavors. Specific flavors like mocha, a toffee, a coffee, uh, even burnt toast. I've gotten that in pieces, in places. Um, and that is, th those are flavors, they don't exist anywhere else. You're not, you're not getting hints of coffee or toffee really from any other source. Not from the grape and not from anything the winemaker does and not from a fermentation process. If you get mocha, that's probably from a very toasty barrel. And barrels can be toasted a little bit or a lot. So they can add a little bit of that flavor or a lot bit of that flavor. It's just like you making toast at home. The, the cooper can burn the hell out of the inside of that barrel and they can do a light toast. And when you're making literally toast at home, you can put a light toast where it's still mostly white bread or you can burn the hell out of it and it's black toast. Same with barrels. They actually, the uh, winemaker, even after they buy the barrels from a cooper and they have them in house, they will sporadically, some, Winemakers will sporadically kind of uh, uh, liven up or, uh, you know, kind of fire up a barrel in between batches. So maybe they've used a barrel for a couple different batches of wine already, and they've ate, it's been used for two years, aging wines. And they want to, they you know, kick it back uh, up a notch. They might take the barrel and burn the inside of it with a torch to char off some of the edges, which are kind of leached out and used up, and... Therefore, they can toast it up some more. That helps rejuvenate the wood, go a layer deeper so that you can, so the next batch of wine can pull more wood flavor out and tannins and vanilla, but it also therefore will add to the toastiness factor. So all these descriptors that I'm using are from wood, all the ones I just listed, not from the grape. And let me restress. It depends on what grape you are using. It depends on what wine you are putting into that barrel. That should still be the overwhelming amount of flavor and aroma that you, the wine drinker, detect comes from the grape, comes from the wine. What is it? Then if you get these other things that I've now listed for you, that's from the wood. And the more of those flavors you get, the more of these wood-inspired flavors you get, the more time in wood that wine has seen. Okay, got it? Pretty straightforward. More equals more. But how much more? How much more is good? How much time is the winemaker going to let its wine sit in that barrel? Ah, let's turn to those winemaker options with barrels next.